This program has been funded by a grant from Criterion Group, whose companies provide investment management services to mutual funds, individuals, and institutional investors. Uh, tonight I want to look at healthy families. Last week I introduced this series by talking about the crisis in the family. And I, I talked about essentially how that crisis in the family impacts us individually. And as you, uh, as you watch this program tonight and as you watch the program in the weeks to come, I hope you'll be watching it in the weeks to come, I hope that you'll be thinking about your own life. How happy are you really? Where are you in your love life? Do you really feel like you have someone you love that you give love to and they give love back to you? Uh, do you really feel good about your sex life and how you function sexually, about your emotional life, about your volitional life? That is, are you really making choices about your life are you really choosing to have your life or is your life a kind of a unconscious accident? Is it really a choice? Are you really doing what you want to do with your very own life? Or is it a choice? Is it really a choice that you really know where you're going? You really will know who your friends will be so most, mostly five years from now. Uh, that you really have control of your life. See, those are the issues that I'm talking about as the crisis because we can, we can look at our superficial life and we've got a car and we've got a house and we've got enough money and uh, even at our comforts, even at our activities, our active life, and all of that can still gloss over a lot of hopelessness in a person, a lot of loss of self in a person. So we really want to look at that. I said the crisis of today was the crisis of the lost self. If you remember last week, we talked about the private self and the public self and how in the beginning of life, the private self and the public self are the same. A child's not putting on an act. A child's not pretending. A child's not adapting to survive. And that very early on, for many of us, I'm going to say for most of us, at least to some degree, and some to a greater degree than others, Pretty soon this public self, this conforming self, this self that wants to stay in the group and is afraid of abandonment or rejection, this conforming self, this false self, this act begins to take over. So that by the time we reach puberty, many of us are more an act, a performance. We're more human doings than we are human beings. We're more an external self or a mask or a persona or a script than we are ourselves. And then the tragedy is that many people go to their death that way. And I talked about Willie Loman, who never knew who he was, the great kind of saint of our day, the saint of our day done beautifully in that play, The Death of a Salesman, that he never knew who he was at his death. And I quoted Leon Bloss saying that the only, there's only one sorrow, the sorrow of not being a saint. That is missing the mark, having gone through your life and missed the mark. So what we're talking about in this series is functionality. And that's what I want to talk about tonight is functionality. What is the soil that we need to have in our families in order to become fully functional human beings? Now remember, I didn't say fully normal human beings because I've really been making a point of it in this series that it isn't normal. That it, that's not what we're looking for is normalcy because a lot of what's normal is not so healthy. That's what I'm going to argue in this series. 
a lot of our normal child rearing practices really are overbalanced on the side of obedience and authority and children should be seen and not heard and uh, you're a child so speak when you're spoken to and you need to obey any adult no matter who that adult is no matter how they're treating you that, that our child rearing practices are highly imbalanced in that direction and that what we need to balance those practices is vitality, spontaneity, creativity, inner independence, critical reflection, sensuality. We need all of that to balance this other side so we have whole human beings and not human beings who are walking around having split off their sexuality, split off their sensuality, having split off their emotions, having split off their intellection, their real thoughts about things, their real feelings about things, their real desires about things, so that we become acts, we become masks, we become performances. So we really want to look at that. Now a healthy family, now and remember what I said last week, that a family is a system and I'm letting this mobile represent the idea of a family system that as a system it is the interdependence of the parts rather than the sum total of the parts so the notion of a family system is the notion of feedback system circularity that each part affects every other part so that if I push this part, you notice what happens. Every other part is affected. If, if I push this part, every other part is affected. That every person in the system is interdependent on every other person in the system. And I suggested to you last week that we better understand the nature of families and family systems. I suggested to you that we've begun to understand as we've studied the phenomena of black Nazism and how a Hitler could happen that any leader who discovers the laws of the systems that people were raised in can control masses of people. That Hitler understood the structure, the authoritarian structure of the German family. And that's why Caroline Payne argued in her book, The Neurosis of Nations, that Germany and the Weimar Republic could never be democratic. Because you can't have people in autocracy and ideological totalitarianism families who suddenly at 21 or 2 become democratic. And hey, folks, in the last 75 years, what, how many hundred million people have died? at the pinnacle of civilization. And what I'm arguing is that there's no simple answer to the problem, but the basic radical source of the problem is in the families and the way we are learned, the way we are taught socialization and the kinds of structure, family structures that we come out of. So we've got to begin to understand the law of the system. Now, tonight when I talk about a healthy family, and I'm going to sh show you some slides in a minute about healthy families, a healthy family, in a sense, will always be in motion. It'll be in movement. It'll be open and flexible. It'll be open and flexible. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't go into this in any detail last week, but family systems, like all systems, can either be open systems or they can be closed systems. And two weeks from now, when we talk about the dysfunctional family, I'll be talking about the family system as closed. The boundaries are closed. And then in the, especially in the fifth program when I talk about sexual abuse, the persecuted and physical abuse, we'll talk about how closed those incest families are. And, and there are many, many incest families in this culture. You know, somebody once said about uh, an incest offender that we want to kill them until you know that you know one and that one out of four girls are the victims of incest of some kind of sexual abuse by age 13 by somebody over 18 that according to the Life magazine special of 1984 34 million adult women 
are walking around right now in this society who were sexually abused in their childhood. Now to me that is just an awesome statistic. It's even more awesome to me than that 65 million people's lives are seriously affected by alcoholism. That's a awesome enough. Uh, or addiction. And, and most of incest and pedophilia is a form of sexual addiction, which we will be talking about when I talk in the fourth program about the compulsive family, about sexual addiction, which is just as widespread as chemical addiction and is probably sort of the latecomer on the scene for us to understand. But a healthy family is going to be vibrant. The parts are going to be in motion. There's going to be flexibility. It won't be grim and rigid. There'll be spontaneity in this family. There'll be joy in this family. People can laugh and play and have fun. That's one of the basic needs. And next week when we talk about dysfunction, you'll see that the higher the anxiety in the family, in a sense, the grimmer, the more uptight the family structure is, the less there's going to be any room for individuality. So a family needs to be an open system. It needs to be able to be vibrant and moving. And always in a family, we're going to have the polarity of individuality, this individual person, and togetherness, all of these people together. Now, we need to belong. That's one of our basic needs. We need to belong. We also need to self-actualize. That's another one of our basic needs. Or you need a private self and you need a public self. You need both of these polarities. So always in a family there is a tension between these two polarities. It doesn't have to be a severe tension, but a polarity. And in a healthy family it's going to be open and vibrant and moving around and see all of a sudden daddy's over here and mama's over here. So daddy's doing the dishes. See, daddy doesn't always have to do what daddies do. It's not rigid in the sense that the roles are so rigid, there's no flexibility. And that people just can't be who they are. One day you feel like doing something different. And the kids don't always have to be put in rigid roles, as we will see dysfunctional systems will do. They will assign roles to the children in the families. In healthy families, the children choose their roles. Now, you may be a big helper around the house, but in a healthy family, you will have chosen that role. It will not have been assigned to you by the system, the power of the system. See, groups are very strong, folks. They did a study at Princeton. And, and, and by the way, I, I'm not going to try to give you a lot of clinical analytical accuracy in this series. Uh, I'm always struggling in my head between the scholars out there. I got my part of my education at a place called the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies. Uh, and there were real scholars there, and my, my scholar teachers are going to be throwing their sweaty nightcaps in the air when they hear how unscholarly that I'm going to be in this series. And there's a struggle in me between those two things. But what I know is I need to get this information out. This is known by the people in the field. It's known by the experts, but it is not known at all by the ordinary folks. It's not something you took in school. In fact, family systems theory is only about 35, 40 years old. So it's very new in the history of human thought. Somebody's compared it to the old, the uh, old, old uh, approaches to therapy, therapy as Freud was to insane asylums where they locked people up and put them in bondage because they were mad or crazy. So this is really an advance. Uh, what you're going to begin to see is that if, if, if the system is healthy, all the people in the system will be healthy. If part of the system is sick, that is, if daddy's an alcoholic, everybody in the system is going to be part of an alcoholic system. And now we have a program called the Adult Children of Alcoholics or the Children of Alcoholics that's sweeping across the country and millions of people are finding refuge in that program because they realize that they were raised in families that had the no talk, the no feel, the no intimacy rule, and that they've been married a couple of times or they don't know how to express feelings or they don't really know how to talk about problems and they don't know how to get in touch 
uh, with intimacy. They don't know how to be intimate because they've come from systems that the rules of the system disallowed that. Now, in healthy families, you have a healthy relationship between mama and daddy. This daddy and this mama are the chief components. Their relationship is the chief component. It's like the motor of your car. If the motor of your car uh, it goes out, that's it. You, you can lose a fender. You can lose visors. You can lose a lot of other things. They're not the chief components. But if you don't have a motor, you can't drive your car. So if the mother and daddy do not have a good relationship, now what is a good relationship? A good relationship means that mother and father, these two people, are getting their needs met. Basically, they're in a process of getting their needs met. Mama has a relationship with herself. Daddy has a relationship with his self. That is, they, they are not alienated. They are not split inside. They're in the process of becoming whole people. Now, when you think of people getting married at 19 or 20 or 17 or 18 or 22 or 23 or having babies at 17 and 18 and 19 and 20, pretty grim, pretty grim developmentally to think that anybody could be where I'm talking about tonight, uh, talking about in this program, maybe shown in the day, uh, talking about what this family, what this couple is like. Uh, it's hard for me to think. I mean, if it's up to me, I wouldn't have anybody marry under 32 uh, <laughs> because there's some developmental stages you need to go through. Uh, and, and that you, you know, and I'm going to talk about this in the last program, but anybody can have a child. I'm going to say this in every program. You don't need any training to have a child. It takes more training to do anything than have a child. You don't need any training whatsoever. And this is our greatest natural resource, our children. It's the future of the world. It's the future of human life as we know it. So when we begin to think about that, it's kind of awesome. Now, this woman has a good relationship to herself. This man has a good relationship to himself. Look, if they have a good relationship, now this is a work of art, this man can even leave her and she can stay in some balance. That is, her life doesn't depend on him and his life doesn't depend on her. Does that make sense to you? That, that a good relationship does not have necessity in it. That is, you're in the relationship by choice, not by necessity. Now, there's another thing, and I'll talk more about this next week, uh, what I'm going to call an entanglement. An entanglement or an entrapment is different than a relationship. In an entanglement, you can't get out. You can't get out. It's two half people, two incomplete people who come together and become enmeshed. They're all entangled. They can't get out because each one is incomplete and each one married the other one in order to get complete. What I hear all the time, what I did in the first part of my marriage, I can remember this so well, constantly telling my wife, you never take care of me. You, you know, you're not doing, you know, you're not really taking care of me. And, and, and that, that part of me, and oh man, when I was courting her, none of that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I was the, I was Mr. Wonderful. Because, you see, I was a very codependent. We're going to talk about that in the seventh program, codependency. I was a very codependent person who was very incomplete, very fragmented inside. My public self was an act. My private self was so far down, I didn't know where it was. And so I was looking for a mother. I was looking for somebody who would complete me and take care of me. Now, when I was courting my wife, when I was, we were in the in love stage, Oh, man, I did everything for her. Wrote poetry, sent flowers, gave presents. And be careful of this, folks. I'm warning you <laughs> to be careful of people like me uh, because there's a great seduction in it. And you get sucked in thinking, oh, he's going to take care of me. She's going to take care of me. And then you get married. See, and then it comes on. You're both needy. You married out of neediness, not out of wholeness. 
Uh, and so now you're both trying to get. Neither one of you can give because you're both trying to get. Now in a healthy relationship, you can give because your needs are being met. Now, what are our basic needs? Abe Maslow talks about, I put self-value first, but probably raw security is first. Just enough food, clothing, shelter, basic physiological needs. Every human being needs that. Uh, then self-value, some sense of worth and self-value. And, and I'm telling you, in my opinion, this is the crisis of our day. It's a crisis of self-value. It is people who do not love themselves. We the people do not love ourselves. We have this lost self in there. We don't know who we are. We play out our sex role scripts and our little scripts about success and being a successful person in this culture. What a successful man is, usually making money, being highly achieved, having all the symbols of success. But are we successful? Have we really found in this one and only life who we are? Now, self-worth comes by mirroring. If these two people farming this family come together out of healthy families, they've had good mirroring. You see, interestingly enough, my self-image comes out of your eyes. And my self-image is going on right now. If I look into your eyes and I start seeing boredom, I start seeing people kind of looking away, bored, and irritated. I start seeing someone get irritated. There's a tendency in me to begin to think that I'm boring, that I'm irritating. And, and self-image goes on all our life. It goes all, mi the mirroring of others. That's why we need each other. When I come to the ninth program in this series and talk about health, I'm going to talk about or the eighth program, when I have Terry Kellogg on, and we talk about support groups, how much people need support groups, how you need a community of people to love you and be there for you because sociality is one of our basic needs. Why? Because I can't know myself if I'm not loved. If there are no eyes that reflect me, I cannot know myself. Now, for me right now, if I saw you becoming bored or angry, there's several things I could do. I'd probably take it on uh, and think, oh my God, I'm really bad today. But I wouldn't necessarily have to. You could have stomach aches. Uh, you could be tired and hungry. Okay? There could be a lot of reasons why I saw that in your eyes. But suppose I'm six months old. Suppose I'm one year old. Suppose I'm a year and a half old. Do you begin to see what the reflection in your eyes start meaning? And if there's not a mother there looking down on that baby, wanting that baby? Because see, a baby doesn't, have any, baby doesn't have any language. A baby is pure feeling. And we say that babies are perfect inner communicators. They know what's going on under your skin all the time. In fact, Marcel Geber did this study on Ugandi babies for the United Nations. She went over there, try, actually she went over there to study brain damage, protein deficiency brain damage. And she found in the first two years of life that these Uganda babies were the healthiest babies in the world. That they were higher on the Arnold Gazelle tests, the psychological tests that you measure growth on, than American babies, than European babies, than any babies in the world. And they found that what it was about was bonding bonding, that these babies stayed right there next to their mother's breast, right next to their mother's stomach, that they were carried in these gowns, that they were in motion all the time, they were being moved, that their mother's eyes were always there for them, they were always there for them, so that these babies felt the oneness with these mothers. Now, see, if, if you're 17 and you get pregnant and you don't want the kid, but you go ahead and have the child. I'm not telling you not to have the child because I'm going to tell you right now, I think abortion is one of the overarching child abuses in our world. Uh, but, but if you go ahead and have the child and you don't want the child, that baby will feel it in the womb. That baby will feel it every moment of the first year and a half of its life. If you don't like the baby's sex, if you're a woman and you're furious at men and you have a little boy baby, it's going to be bad news for that kid. Uh, 
as you are a baby and you deal with your instinctual drives, a little child touches himself or herself uh, genitally. If mama is uptight sexually, child's going to get contempt. The child's going to start feeling the feelings of the mother. So a great deal of self-value is happening in that first narcissistic mirroring. The only way anyone can have identity is by to have a face there that loves you, that accepts you, that values you for the very one you are, that accepts you in all your ambivalence. That is, a mama who, who, is, who is healthy enough in herself that she doesn't need the child as her narcissistic gratification. You see, if a mama is deprived narcissistically, she will make her own children the object of her narcissistic gratification. Listen to what I'm saying, folks. It means that if you didn't get what I'm talking about in the beginning, if you didn't get a mother there who valued you as the single one you are, who loved you just for the one you were, who took you seriously, who, who looked at all the ambivalence the, when you were a good girl, but also when you were a so-called annoying girl. We call them bad girl. Uh, but there really aren't any bad babies. There are no bad girls or good girls or bad boys or good boys. Not prior to 11 years old. Uh, that is because we know that moral conscience isn't formed till about seven or eight. Kohlberg at Harvard did the best studies, the most extensive studies that have ever been done on moral development. We don't even talk about a person in the moral ballpark prior to seven or eight. So there's great moral abuse that goes on. But this self-value starts with that mirroring. If the mirroring is good, if you're accepted for the very one you are, no matter what, no matter what, when you eat your spaghetti and it gets all over your face, when you go to the potty on yourself, doesn't mean mama has to rejoice. But the idea is that mama is healthy enough that you don't have to please your mother as her narcissistic gratification. You need enough security. What is security? Predictability. You know, I, I, I've told this uh, several times, but uh, some of you may not have heard it. The idea that if you're reading a story to a kid, you ever been reading a story to a kid and try to skip a page or skip a paragraph? If they've heard the story, no way, man. They'll say, wait a minute. Well, they'll catch on it because they need a world that's coherent. They need a world that's coherent and predictable. See, I, I, I'm going to say later on about workaholism and workaholic fathers who aren't there most of the time and the kinds of damage that are done to families by the compulsivity of workaholism. It's an enormous problem that's hardly even looked at in our culture. A strokes, a need for love and belonging, that's what strokes are. You need physical strokes or you'll die. So these two people who start in this family, they, they have their, their stroke economy is up. Their, their stroke ecology is balanced. They're getting enough strokes. They don't have to make their kids be the stroke givers. Because next week when I talk about unhealthy families, I'm going to talk about the kids have to take care of the parents. And the kids figure it out pretty quick, man. If I'm going to make it around here, I better take care of her, him. That they're demanding that the price I've paid for being born is taking care of them. See, look, these two re realize fairly early on that they're not going to get from the other because they're both needy in an unhealthy family. Then the children, they say, let's have a kid. Maybe the kid can make me happy. In a healthy family, they already are getting from each other. That's why it's so important for people to wait before they have children, to be ready to have children, to really know what they're doing when they bring children into the world. Now, you need stimulation. You need to play and have fun. You need challenge. And one of, the, one of the things about healthy families is that there's lots going on. And everybody can, can, can have some individuality. One brother wants to ice skate, and another brother likes to play baseball, but this brother doesn't like to play baseball. That doesn't challenge daddy's manhood so bad that he forces this kid to play baseball. He forces this kid to be an athlete because daddy can't handle it. Daddy's real comfortable within himself. Daddy's getting his needs met. So he can handle stimulation, differences. In healthy families, people can be different. 
People can be different. Structure, families need structure. Uh, I, I came out of a lot of very strong, ruled religion and family structure, a lot of uh, authoritarian religion, and uh, in a sense I've tried to compensate for that by treating my son like a little boy wished he had a daddy, and a lot of the times I haven't put enough structure there. Children need limits. They need limits, just like I need limits, because I get scared without limits. If you went over the big bridge uh, in Galveston every every day without any, any guardrails, gets nervous. You get nervous without limits. So there is a need for limits, and, and, and it's abusive to children not to, not, to, not to put limits, not to give them the security of limits. So structure. Now, those are what Abraham Maslow called the deficiency needs. That is, you, you need all of those to be able to get to self-actualization. You can't start self-actualizing if you're starving. You can't go for holistic meditation consciousness if you don't have any love in your life, although a lot of people do. And that's a big problem, and I want to really address that problem in the later programs of trying to substitute what you didn't get in your family by going into religion is one of the most common places people do that and then make the religious structure kind of the stuff you didn't get, but that's still not being fulfilled. It's still not getting these needs met. You see, these needs, what, why we know these are basic needs is that people get sick if they don't have them, and that when we give them these needs, they start getting well. That's how we know they're basic needs. That is, you cannot live without them. Now, self-actualization needs, I'll talk about those in the ninth program. Those are the being needs. That's the need to begin to transcend, to have something greater than yourself. Uh, Ab Abraham Maslow felt that the need for truth, the need for beauty, the need for goodness, the need for wholeness, the need for completeness, that those were needs that were rooted in our biology. Eric, er Eric Fromm once said, you know, we have eyes and we have things to see. If there was nothing to see, it'd be crazy. We have ears, and there are things to hear. If there was nothing to hear, it'd be crazy. We have a heart, and there was, if there was nothing to love, it would be crazy. And we have a longing that, that no matter what we do, it's never quite enough. You know, is that all there is? Is that all there is? One of the great, one of the great somebody, I don't know who said this, but some great person said it, even after Dante and Shakespeare and Mozart, we say, is that all? You ever gone to the show everybody was talking about and you saw it and you were a little disappointed? And the dance, the big dance that was coming, you were a little disappointed? This Mr. Wonderful they were talking about or Miss Wonderful and you went and heard them and a little disappointed? See, because somebody, Augustine, said there are places in the, you know, there, there, there's a longing in our heart. Our, you've, you've made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless. There's something that we're not complete with. We keep longing for transcendence. And Abe Maslow and many others, even though I say that as a Christian theologian, I believe that, but biologically Maslow felt he found that rooted in our nature, that there was a need for something greater than ourselves. So healthy families are going to be committed to something greater than themselves. This mother and daddy are going to have a relationship with God or something greater than themselves. Humankind, generativity, mankind, and whatever that greater is, it's going to be a transcendent something. Because on my model of a healthy family, you've got to have that something greater in your life to have joy in life. Otherwise, we stay at the level of ego. We stay at the level of the survival needs. And, and, and man, when I'm at the survival needs, I'm into control and survival. There's no transcendence. So it's very important, in my opinion, that we begin to, we realize that there are these spiritual needs that go, that, that, are, that are the finishing of self-actualization. And I'll say that some more in the ninth program in this series when I talk about health for the family. So when mom and daddy are getting those needs met, uh, they're using these basic powers to see and hear what is here and now. To, feed, to interpret what they see here and now, to feel what they feel, 
And, and that's a big one. You see, if you can't feel what you feel, if you feel scared and someone says, there's nothing to be scared about, what are you scared about? If you want, if you want to be great when you grow up, you say, I want to be a movie star when I grow up and I want to be great, mama. And she says, what's the matter with you wanting all that kind of stuff? If you, if you have an idea about something, you've made an interpretation, you think prejudice is bad and you've got a prejudiced daddy and you say, daddy, I think that's prejudice and you get swamped for it. Or your mama's crying in the kitchen and you walk in the kitchen and you say, what's the matter, mama? And she says, nothing. Go to your room. See how you can get crazy? If, 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 if the family isn't honest, that what's the most important thing in the family is to be honest, to tell the truth at any cost, to tell the truth, to deal with the problems that are happening in the family. That's one of the first rules of a healthy family, to deal with the problems that are happening. Now, healthy families have lots of problems. Please understand that. Healthy families are unlike those postcards that come at Christmas time. Okay? In my opinion, they are. Uh, healthy families are bloody. Healthy families have uh, a lot of conflict that they've worked through. But healthy families are dealing with their problems. And healthy families are allowing people to talk about their feelings, expressing their desires, saying what they think. And everybody in the family gets to talk. Everybody in the family. In fact, I, I recommend, although I never was able to pull this off, I, I hadn't done enough work on myself when I tried it. Uh, I recommend the Democratic Family Council to get families together once a week and let people say their feelings. Let everybody in the family say it. Now, when I did it, I did it like a dictator. Uh, you know, I called the meeting and demanded that they all be there. Well, that's not democracy, folks. Democracy is everybody's an equal, and everybody gets to come and sit around the family council and say what they feel and talk about their problems. They can express themselves. And, and, the, and, the, and the power to intuit and create. So health is characterized by a soil that allows children, that is, this mother and daddy are healthy enough that they can prepare a soil that these children can get their needs met just as this mother and daddy got their needs met. See, the interesting thing is that if this man and this woman met each other, and they probably would choose each other because they were reasonably healthy. Because what I'm going to show you next week is that a dysfunctional person will tend to choose a dysfunctional person. As tragic as that is, a dysfunctional person will walk in the crowd and look around and go, oh, there you are. Been waiting for you all my life. Uh, and uh, you'll just pick them out. You know how to just pick them out of the crowd. Uh, there's some incredible things about my wife and I in terms of the dysfunctions of both of our families that we couldn't even have known. We met on a blind date. Uh, and it's just amazing how we picked each other out and how that impacted our lives and how it was familiar, familiar to us to have these same issues going on in our marriage because they were going on in our families. See, family, familiar, that's what feels right is what happened in your family. Remember, I, I call that the spell that we're all under. It's the family we've come out of. Ronald Lang says, the family you've come out of is the post-hypnotic trance induced in early infancy. It's the source people's emotional language legacy. That is the language, the emotional language you learned in that family. The, the, the way you were allowed to have your powers or your feelings. You see, and, and, and the biggest problem for most people is they don't get to have their feelings. In healthy families, you get to have your feelings. You feel what you feel, and you can express your feelings. You can be angry. Now, you can't act on your anger. You can't burn down the house, but you can say, I'm angry. I want my Barbie doll back. I mean, how many of you got to do that? Look right in those big giants' faces. Say, I don't like it when you take my Barbie doll away from me. You may have done that once or twice. <laughs> And you, you never walked in their bedroom and said, now look, I don't like the way I'm being treated around here. There's some real discrepancy in power here and I don't like it. Uh, you didn't get to say that kind of stuff because what I've suggested to you is that, and we'll talk more about this in the unhealthy family, but in this family then, the soil is, is there where people can have power. How do you get power? By getting your power, by being able to use your powers. See, if I discount the power to perceive, you're going to start getting shamed. 
you can't even trust your own eyes. And that's what happens when kids get shamed. They, they quit trusting their own eyes. So they don't even trust themselves anymore. Or you don't trust your own interpretations. Or you don't trust your feelings. Or you don't trust your desires. Or you don't trust your imagination. Or you don't trust your powers. If you can't trust your powers, you can't trust yourself. And that's how that little person gets lost very early on. Now, Virginia Satir, who's a great family therapist, talks about the freedoms, and I'm only going to do this once, so you, this is a little academic, but it's really important for you to realize that, that, that we have these freedoms, that when a person is fully functional, what does that mean? It means everything works. See, what? when my car functions, everything works. When a human being is fully functional, everything works. So the freedoms to see and hear what you see and hear. See, that was the first power. So, so the freedoms are based on the powers rather than what you should see and hear. See, cause remember when the, the empress has no clothes on in the story, the little kid's standing there and here comes the empress riding on her horse and she doesn't have any clothes on. The little kid goes, Mama, look, she doesn't have any clothes on. Everybody goes, shh. See, the whole town was playing the game of denial and delusion. Now, I, I told you earlier that, or I didn't tell you, did I? I told you before the program started that we'd have some questions tonight. So if you have any questions, you can write them out and pass them over. Uh, and I'll try to, I'll take the last few minutes and talk about them. Uh, but the idea is that you can see and hear what you see and hear. See, kids get crazy if they can't see and hear what they see and hear. Uh, to know what you know rather than what you should know. To want what you want rather than what you should want. See how those go with the powers? The freedom of my powers. And then I'm not split inside. I want what I want. And it's okay to want what you want. Now, I'm going to tell you, in, in every healing that I know of, that's what happens to people. In the salvation system of Judeo-Christianity, the, the message is, I love you just like you are. Not that you've got to do a bunch of stuff. I accept you just like you are. All you have to do is accept the acceptance. So these seven freedoms are what heal people. They, put, they atone people. They put people together. They'll make you at one. See, because now my eyes don't, I don't have to deny my own eyes. I don't have to deny my own mind. I don't have to deny my own feelings or my own wants or my own imagination. You see, imagination is the creative virtue. It's, it's through imagination that we, we see new things. Imagination is the, is, the, is the center of hope. You can't have hope without imagination because hope is possibility. Maybe I can. Maybe it's possible for me. That's hope. And without imagination, there's no hope. And schools do a lot to crush that too, to kill that, that, that value. Uh, to feel what you feel rather than what you feel, to express what you express rather than what you should express, to create what you want rather than what you should create. In other words, to have your one and only life, let it be your life. That's what we're going for, and that's what healthy families do. They allow people to have these freedoms. So in a healthy family, here's mom, here's dad, here are the children. See, here are the good boundaries. The roles are all flexible. All the boundaries are permeable. That is, I can get into your boundary, but you have a boundary. Daddy and Mama have boundaries. Daddy and Mama preserve their limits. Uh, Daddy and Mama are self-disciplined disciplinarians. We're going to talk about the unself-disciplined disciplinarians. First 10 years of my marriage, I was an unself-disciplined disciplinarian. Oh, I disciplined my children. I would chase them around and scream and holler and assign punishments. And then I'd feel so bad about it because I had such bad boundaries that I let them walk all over me for about a month until I couldn't take it anymore. And then I'd go chasing them again and issue all these punishments to them. But because of my own bad boundaries, my own codependency, my own difficulty with boundaries, you see, I was unself-disciplined. So you can't be a disciplinarian to your children if you're unself-disciplined. That is, if you're not complete within yourself, because what they do is they swallow you. They want to be just like you. We talk about the garbage can child. That's the child the parents are in the most conflict with almost always is the one just like the parent. And see, so what the parent's doing is saying, I'm going to fix you, instead of saying, I'm going to fix myself, and then, then you'll, you'll want to be like me. 
the parent keeps trying to fix the child. Okay? So in healthy families, you have these flexible roles and good communication, and everybody has their own unique boundaries. See, in a good relationship, in a good family, it's like an orchestra. Everybody's playing their own instrument, but they're playing the same tune. Okay? Instead of, oh, look at this. Now, here is the togetherness error. Remember I said togetherness, individuality? This is enmeshed. Everybody's all enmeshed. See, nobody has their own individuality. They're all enmeshed. This is called the undifferentiated ego mass. Everybody's all thrown together here. Now, I'm not going to take time because we're talking about healthy families. I'm going to talk a lot more about this. But I just want you to see that. And then here's the stone wall family. This family has rigid boundaries. Uh, this is the neglect family. See, they've got boundaries, but nobody can get in anybody's boundaries. There's no way you can communicate with anybody. The no talk rule, don't express feelings in this family. Uh, they're all there. They're all individuals, but they're just all separate from each other. So you see, in that family, there's no real way for anybody to be close, although everybody is desperately lonely in that family. This may be a highly intellectual family. They're all, they're all bright and they're all straight-A students, but nobody shares feelings in this family. There's no vulnerability. Everybody's in a role in this family, and we'll talk a lot more about that. Now, in a healthy marriage, I want to read you something. This is by uh, uh, Judith Barwick, who wrote an article about divorce as the erosion of commitment. And she said uh, something like that healthy families are not like postcards. Uh, I'm not going to quote it. I don't have time. Healthy families are not like, like postcards. Healthy families and healthy couples go through stages. In fact, they did a study of some 300 couples where, that had been together for 30 years, and they found that that couple had gone through a romantic stage. They had gone through being in love with each other. Okay? Then when they got married... Boy, something different happened. That was the Hatfields and the McCoys. Now, she brings her whole family system and he brings his whole family system. They each bring their family system and it's going to take about 10 years to work all that out. And in most couples, it takes about 10 years to work that out. Do we have questions yet? Okay. Um, it takes about 10 years to work that out and it's what we call the power struggle or the differences stage. In my family, Mama used to cook dinner at at 2 o'clock every Sunday afternoon, mashed potatoes, fried chicken, lima beans. I got married. First five Sundays, nothing. <laughs> See, in her family, that isn't the way they did it. That isn't the way they did it. In my family, we opened the presents on Christmas Eve. We opened them fast. We didn't save the paper. <laughs> her family, you got to watch while everybody opens their presents. They save all this crud, ne ne you know, never to be used again. Okay? You got it? That's two family systems. Then the third stage is when you really get into middle, midlife, 35 or so, if you stay together. Highest divorce rate is 29 to 33, so a lot of couples don't make it through power struggle differences. But it's owning your projections. It's like a man will try to make a woman take a woman's feelings and make her the domestic one. Our sex roles promote that. What we come to get is that nobody can make us happy. And that we, intimacy is two people standing side by side. It's sharing, not just sexuality, but feelings, intellectual stuff, beauty, problem solving, raising kids, maybe sharing, losing the luggage in the airport. That could be high moment of intimacy. And that in intimacy, there's, there's detachment or solitude. That is, you can be apart from the one you love and they'll still be with you as opposed to enmeshment when you're apart from them, you just go empty and lonely. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, so, so the four stages, the last stage, it took these couples 30 years to get to intimacy. It took them 30 years. Uh, they did a, a, a survey in Psychology Today, What Keeps a Marriage Going? Here are the top reasons respondents gave, and very interestingly, I don't know how many people responded, but they, the husbands and wife on the first four all said the same thing. My spouse is my best friend. The man said that and the woman said that. I like my spouse as a person. The man said that. The woman said that. 
uh, marriage is a long-term commitment. The man said that. The woman said that as number three. Number four, marriage is sacred. Marriage is sacred. We agree on aims and goals. We agree on aims. This, this was unbelievable that they had all these same things together. They were their best friends and they respected each other. Much more than that in love kind of feeling or that, you know, heart-pounding sexuality. For most people that doesn't last, although they can work at it. And, and I'm certainly not saying anything against that. Let me, let me look at a couple of questions. What's happening to our children now that more and more mothers are working outside the home? Will the family survive the movement? Ideally, children need a mother and a daddy. The male part and the female part are a balancing part of every human being. We're androgynous. That is, I have a male side to me. I'm made of a male and a female, and I need the receiving, tender, caring parts as well as I need the assertive, outgoing, aggressive parts of me. Uh, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. My daddy was gone for the most part by the time I was seven. I had baseball idols. I had a grandfather as a model. The thing here is that the mother doesn't need to be and can't be the father. And for mamas not to try to be fathers or for fathers not to try to be mothers. What mama needs is a good support group where she's getting her needs met and not try to, to, to go in there and be the mother and the father to that child. Um, have you ever met a healthy family? <laughs> I have met a functional family. Uh, I, I think that my family is functional. It's not, it's not without problems. There are lots of problems. And it hasn't always been functional. Uh, we're not what I'm describing tonight, although we've been through a lot of these stages. I know some families that are functional. I know a lot of families in PADAP, the Palmer Drug Abuse Program. I know a lot of AA people. I know a lot of people in therapy who are getting functional. That is, they're dealing with their problems. They're not you know, postcards or Ozzy and Harriet stuff. Uh, because, see, I don't think that exists. And let me tell you something I haven't said about intimacy. Intimacy is not possible if conflict is not possible. If you're in one of these, yes, darling, no, darling, yes, darling, no, darling, anything you want, darling, anything you want, you're going to go crazy in a, in a relationship like that because you can't be who you are. Uh, so I've never met a healthy family like I'm describing tonight. This is the... This is the ideal. Families seem to be getting smaller, only one child, and many. What impact does this have on emotionally healthy, uh, emotional health or illness? I, I really don't know. I, I can tell you, I have two stepchildren. Uh, Brenda was 10 when I married Nancy, or nine, and uh, uh, I don't think I could have raised more than one uh, of my own. So I don't know how people do it, and I think the, some of the big family stuff uh, really was problematic in terms of people trying to meet the needs of all those children. I'm personally glad. I think better care can be given to children if there are a smaller number of children. That's just my opinion. I don't think there's any emotional impact on the world because there's only one child in the family. If a person did not have their basic needs met while growing up, how can he or she correct that? Well, what I say is if you didn't get it in the beginning, there's a grieving you're going to have to do for it. And we're going to talk about that in program eight. Uh, and uh, that grief process is really crucial for people. Uh, but it can be done. And you can learn to, to use what you've got, even though you may have had some real serious scars, you can learn to use what you've got. I saw a guy in Toronto one time ice skating on one leg. And I wept when I watched him. I couldn't believe my eyes. I went and looked from four angles to be sure that I was seeing what I was seeing. Uh, and and what that's, that, that's always been a symbol to me of people <laughs> overcoming. Okay, what healthy families really are saying is that life is problem and that we meet the problem. But I love this quotation by Gibran, and this is what I think happens in healthy families. Your children are not your children. They're the sons and daughters of life longing for itself. See, in a good family, mom and daddy are complete enough to know that life goes forwards, not backwards. They are God's creation. They're expressions of their maker. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, they do not belong to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls are the image of God, and their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but don't try to make them like you. 
For life goes forwards, not backwards. It does not tarry with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children are living as living arrows are sent. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he, the maker, bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. Rejoice that you're part of life prolonging itself and going on, that we're bringing children in the world, meeting our evolutionary vocations, that we're committing to life and life goes forwards and not backwards. I need to love that child and be there for that child. And as Alice Miller said one time, learn from that child. That child can teach you more about emotional life than anything you've learned. You can even learn more from your children than often you can learn from your parents because the parents are carrying all their old tapes and resentments and problems and often working it out with the children. Your children are the children of life. That's what healthy families teach.